Hi there Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a tag video. This is the Literary Fiction Book Tag which was an original tag by Jasmine Reed. It's her first ever tag that she's created. Well done Jasmine. This is a great tag to really open up the debate as to what we think we mean by uh, literary fiction. Okay so prompt one. How do you define literary fiction? Well I try not to define it because um, I don't really define any type of fiction other than any type of literature other than fiction and non-fiction and even that breaks down when you have things like memoir and creative fiction but you know I know what the debate is so I'll give you my sort of thoughts uh, on on literary fiction um, so I don't have a unified definition I just have some observations and you can take or leave them as, as, as you will so that my first definition would be um, serious minded literature uh, and the first thing to disabuse uh, is the idea that uh, literary fiction can't be funny. It can be. That doesn't mean it's not serious minded. So plenty of very funny, uh, serious uh, literary fiction by the likes of Steve Tolt, Steve Tessick, uh, Laurent Binet and lots of others. So I don't mean that it's not funny. By serious minded, I mean that it's trying to do something other than tell a story. Uh, it may uh, want to tell a story. But it's also aware, in a reflexive way, of all literature that has preceded it, whether it refers to it directly or not. So it is very consciously uh, sort of considering its place in the spectrum of, of literary fiction, not necessarily the canon, but in terms of any author really is partly informed by everything that they've read. So I think uh, serious-minded uh, fiction is cognizant and is constantly dialoguing with other books and other authors that have gone to make up that author's own makeup. So that's what I mean by literary fiction. Uh, another way of, of trying to sort of break it open is that literary fiction is internal and other forms of fiction such as genre fiction is external. Uh, and by that I mean that literary fiction uh, many, most literary fiction books have plots which consist of incidents or events but the difference between literary fiction and genre fiction is that literary fiction will consider the ramifications or the outcome of those incidents and events will we'll sort of pause to reflect on them whether that's the author directly or the character whereas um, sort of genre work tends to move from incident and event to incident and event because the plot is what is driving and leading the book uh, rather than a sort of internal examination and that's not to say there are plenty of genre books that don't have internality and reflectiveness in them but I'm just saying generally across the board uh, that is a, a, another sort of way of, of looking at uh, literary fiction uh, versus sort of genre fiction and just to say why I try not to define literary fiction is I don't I'm not a believer in as I say in any kind of genre to me the notion of genre is just a way of breaking up the million or so titles each year that are released so that people can find them either online because of um, algorithms you know if you like this book you'll like this or if you look for the tag it says science fiction or romance or chick lit or horror or whatever uh, plus the marketing departments of books, that's how they push books. Um, and it seems to me that literary fiction is so called because they're all the books that can't be f easily fitted into any of the other uh, genres. Uh, so it's a complete nonsense. So even though I've said what I've said, and that's how I think about literary fiction, I guess, um, I don't really hold uh, to the concept of there being this thing called literary fiction. So prompt two, name a literary fiction novel with a brilliant character study. Well, any of your favourite five star literary fiction books are going to have a fantastic character study because that's, you know, that's what is at the heart of most literary fiction. Given that there's only five or six stories, uh, you know, these are recycled endlessly in any novel, um, you know, be it The Prodigal Son or... A, Jealous Lover or, you know, a version of Oedipus, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. There are, there's only about six to go around. And what makes each novel different and original and fresh and worth reading is the characters that populate that story. Um, so, you know, Mike Michel Faber is brilliant at writing characters. So the, 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 uh, the reverent at the heart of The Book of Strange New Things or Italy in... Um, 
what's it called? His first novel. Um, I can't believe I can't remember it. I'll, uh, I'll uh, you know, do a, a text winding across the screen about this. Um, so, you know, take your pick, really. I'm particularly fond of Neil Bartlett's characters. Um, if that... The question implies you're talking about a single character, presumably the narrator, but I'd actually like to offer this, Valeria Luiselli, The Lost Children Archive, because this is a brilliant character study of four characters in a family, mother, father, uh, and two children, son and daughter. It's a blended family. And it is the best portrayal of a family, particularly of children, that I've ever come across. I mean, this is my read of the year, almost certainly for this year. This is a superb character study of the four individual characters, the father less so, because he's a bit more sort of absent than, than the other three. Um, but how they, how they interact, what their relationships are, and this is stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, three, uh, name a literary fiction novel that, that is, has experimental or unique writing. OK, so metaphorical rolly up on my sleeves on this one. This is my wheelhouse. I do not accept the label experimental for the reasons I've given above why I don't accept any genre label. But if I had to sort of uh, pigeonhole my own writing, and I've often been asked to uh, for marketing and professional reasons, I'd say it is experimental literary fiction. Um, but I really sort of query uh, the usefulness of that notion. You know, what makes a, a book experimental? I mean, it's interesting, this question is phrased as that has experimental or unique writing. So that has experimental writing, as if the whole book is not, but contains experimental. And that's one of my problems with experimental writing as a concept. That too often it's used as bolt-ons or flourishes, you know, the author showing off. It is not necessarily woven organically in, into a novel. And there are plenty of, of successful books that do, in fact, do that. But my problems with, with the notion of experimental writing, how many different or experimental techniques, tropes, whatever you want to call it, does it take to make a novel experimental? So, for, for instance, um, Jasmine mentioned I'm Ben McBride, A Girl is a half formed Thing. Now, I haven't read that one. I've read her other one called The Lesser Bohemians. And that is described as experimental because its language is experimental and how she sets out dialogue on a page is not how it is formally and usually done. But that's, that's the only unconventional thing about it. I don't think that's an experimental novel at all. And I know that that style of portraying dialogue is how she does it in A Girl is a half Form Thing. It's a single element. Uh, I don't think that book's uh, experimental. I think we confuse experimental for unconventional. I think that is part of the problem. So there's, there's a notion of how many experimental elements or unconventional elements does it take to make a book, to classify a book as experimental. And the other thing is experimental things can only be done once. So I need a pause here because I've actually forgot to get the book. So I'll be right back. I found it. So I would say this book is generally experimental. B.S. Johnson, The Unfortunate. Looks like a book, eh? But it isn't. Well, it is. It's a box with a series of chapters, which are sort of like pamphlets. And one is marked first, and there's one marked last, but the rest you can read in any order. So you choose the narrative, and then there's uh, an end piece. I'll post the link to my full review of this book. Um, now, anyone who does a similar choose-your-own-way-through-the-novel, this was written in the 60s, is no longer experimental, because B.S. Johnson beat you to it. And for all I know, someone beat B.S. Johnson to it, I just haven't read that book. So, again, what makes something experimental? You can only do it once. And if you can only do something once, what is the use of having a genre of things that are only done once? Because the, the whole point about genre is... They share things in common and there are sort of unstated rules which have to be observed, which sort of, you know, map the territory of that genre. And by nature, experimental doesn't follow that. So I think for me, experimental, you know, it's very hard to have genuinely experimental language. Like I say, I'm a McBride for me was not experimental language. Two beautiful books that I love, uh, A Clockwork Orange and Milkman. Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess and Milkman by Anna Burns, which won the Man Booker last year. 
fabulous books, would get my all-time top 20 or 50 or something, but they're not experimental, and I've seen Milkman described as experimental. What they is, they create their own languages, and the reader has to kind of decode it, and, and when you get to the point of finally understanding what words or phrases mean what in our language, then you sail, your progress, you sail through the book a lot quicker. So they're very immersive reading experiences, but they're not generally experimental. They, you know, I don't think the language is experimental. It's just immersive. So I think it's really hard to be experimental with language alone. I think experimental refers to form, narrative form, the structure. And there is one exception that I know of, though, about uh, experimental language. This is um, Ben Marcus, uh, The Age of Wire and String. And this is experimental language because he uses language in a way that makes no sense at all until you, again, you immerse yourself in it. But there is, a, there is unlike Milkman, unlike uh, Clockwork Orange, there is a definitive code where this word mean, you know, translates to that word or this phrase is that kind of metaphor or idiom or whatever. This isn't. This is much more sort of impressionistic. You know, he's not repeating words, and if he is, they use it a different way each time. The only way I can explain this is, this is man being observed, as if being observed by, uh, you know, a, a race uh, from another planet, um, who have access to English dictionaries and lexicons, and have a sort of mathematical approach to grammar, but they don't understand the nuance of our language, so they're sort of misapplying words to describe what they're observing about human behaviour which is why it's inconsistent in terms of if a word is used twice, it's not going to mean the same thing the second time. And it's just brilliant. It's a fantastic, you know, there is a poetry in here and there is also the sense of us being reflexive. It's done through the guise of a, an extraterrestrial race, but, it, you know, this is a way to help you think about us human beings in a totally different way. And that is only purely through language. So it can be done, but it's very, very rare for language to be experimental. So that said, I am going to offer an experimental book, and that is this one, Three Dreams in the Key of G by an author called Mark Nash. Yes, well, as I say, you know, when I am challenged by publishers or marketing people to pigeonhole my own work, I say experimental literary fiction. This is my latest book. It has lots of different elements. So again, go back to my first question, how many experimental elements does it take to define a book as experimental? I'm not going to answer that. There are lots of experimental uses of language in here, experimental voice, uh, experimental typography, layout of, of sort of... Um, script on the page, so if I can find it, I'll give you an idea. So it's, you know, things like that. Um, what else? Uh, oh yes, what I do with time in here. So again, coming back to experimentalism, a lot of things that people think are experimental, such as non-linear time, uh, stream of consciousness, fracturing of reality. I mean, the modernist Joyce, Wolf, Beckett, they were all doing that in the sort of, you know, early decades of the 20th century. So they're not, they're no longer experimental. They're quite sort of commonplace, even in sort of mass market novels. Sometimes you'll see some of those techniques like stream of consciousness, for example, being used. So again, you know, what is experimental? I, I don't think... It's possible to do anything new, genuinely new. You can in parts, or you can bring together different elements in a new way, but I don't think you can do something that's so left field, no one's ever done it before. Um, because at the end of the day, you're still dealing with uh, language, and you're still in dialogue with the history of all literature that's preceded you. So that even if you're looking to totally subvert it and sort of, you know, demolish it, you're still referring back to what you want to demolish. So, um, you know, why not have a read of that and see if you think it's experimental or see if you think it's enjoyable without being experimental. Um, name a literary fiction novel with an interesting structure. OK, so for that, I go to uh, Murakami's Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. Um, I'm not a huge Murakami fan, but I had the good fortune that this is the first of his that I read, which made me at least read on some of his others. And gradually I 
dropped off. But this is superb because of its structure. So it's sort of two genre pieces. One is hardball detective fiction, albeit set in Japan. The other is a sort of apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic or imminent apocalyptic science, fantasy, science fiction. And the point is, while you're reading these, you have no idea how they knit together or what, how one speaks to the other at all. There's no clues. But the way he ties it up at the end is brilliant. I'm not going to spoil it, obviously. But the structure of here is one that I admire. And I need to go back and read this to sort of see how he does it. And then to, to reading it a second time, see if actually there are more clues interspersed in earlier parts of the book than, than I picked up. So that's that one. Uh, prompt five, name a literary fiction novel that explores social themes. Well, this is an interesting one because the sort of classic 19th century novels such as, you know, produced by, you know, the Russians and, and the French, like Balzac and Hugo and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, they all have massive social themes, um, be it, you know, class and poverty or the, 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 the decay of the aristocracy in Russia uh, and the oncoming revolution, uh, be it industrialisation, the French Revolution, Germinal, all that sort of stuff. Um, but... Those books are all about the individual characters and their relationships at the heart of it. So sometimes the social stuff is the background against which these characters move. Sometimes it's more active than that, that you know, something like the, the you know, Russian Revolution, you know, impacts the lives and, and, and sort of decisions and choices that these characters face. But I can never get away from the notion that ultimately... These are small stories, even on an epic scale, but they are small stories about the individuals at the heart of the novels, uh, which really would be over, sh would and should be overwhelmed by the social conditions if you were dealing, you know, the social backgrounds. It shouldn't just be background, it should actually be foreground. But it's really, it's like, I compare it to like war reporting. If you're on the front line of a battle trying to report it, you only have, you're only privy to the tiny section you can see with your own eyes. Whereas if the front is happening, you know, all along for miles and miles and miles. So you can only ever have a tiny sort of insight into that. But the war, the battle itself, is much bigger than the individual perspective of the war reporter. And I kind of feel that about social and political novels. Until I read this, The Years by Annie Arnaud. Oh, no. uh, because this is uh, a sort of autofic or part autobiography, but it is dominated by the history and cultural history of France. That is the main character. France is the character much more than any Arno. It is the history of France uh, while you know during her lifetime, basically. So it starts post post Second World War and the changing face of the French countryside, the introduction of consumerism, the politics and the revolution of the 60s, pop music of the 60s, feminism, uh, the sort of decolonisation and, you know, sort of Algeria and, and all of that in France. Then it goes into the sort of socialism of um, Mitterrand and how that sort of disappointed all the old lefties, etc., um, etc. Et it's a brilliant, br you know, this is the history of France through fiction, through a fictional narrative scheme, but the history is true, although you might say it's subjective, but, you know, I think, I think you know, I, I'm not French, but, you know, I recognise a lot of this as France's history during my own lifetime. Um, and I just, I just think this is such a clever book. You know, this is absolutely about a much bigger uh, thing than the, the central character's voice. This is about a whole country, a whole nation, a whole culture. Brilliant. Um... Name a literary fiction novel that explores the human condition. Well, again, you know, almost by some of the definitions I gave earlier, all literary fiction novels explore the human condition. Uh, but for me, no one does it better than Clarice Lispector, Take Your Pick, Agua Viva, The Passion According to G.H., which is the most intense book I've ever read, uh, A Breath of Life, which I read last month, and The Hour of the Star. Um, she's a metaphysical writer. You know, there's no plots, there's no real stories in any of these. It is, it is characters set in spatial and physical proximity and angularity to each other, which then enables them to really sort of, you know, 
meditate, pontificate about themselves. And by that, I don't mean that to sound dry or, or self-indulgent. It isn't. It is because of the language and because of the thoughts and conceptions that she's throwing at you constantly. It is far, far more than that. So, there, you know, there'll be, you know, things about God, death, scale, human scale versus micro insects or cosmic and she you know she leaps around you know through these things effortlessly and they really you know every line gets you thinking gets you reflecting on you know your own sort of feelings about self and being and existence and death and everything so in my my book no one does it better than Clarice Lispector name a brilliant literary hybrid genre novel well the only one I can do for this is House of Leaves by Mark Danie Danielewski, which I didn't even realise was a hybrid uh, genre novel because I thought it was a brilliant work of literary fiction. Quite experimental uh, in the sense of its layout on the page. It, it's a book about a house that is sort of like the TARDIS, it's sort of bigger, sort of bigger than its actual external dimensions would suggest it is, and someone goes off in search of of the secret to that. So it's a book about architecture. So therefore there's a lot in the book of architecture of the text on the page. So there's that sort of repeating spatial patterns, if not word patterns. And it's just really a brilliant, beautiful conception. It's actually about the decay, the decay of a family that is sort of disintegrating. It's about um, mental illness and schizophrenia. It's about a lot of things. Some more stuff. Um, so to me, this was just this was just um, you know a, a, a literary fiction novel, certainly serious minded. But I, you know, I loved it so much. I went online to see what other people said about it, and a lot of people were saying this is a fantastic horror novel or supernatural novel, which never entered my head. But I could kind of see where they were coming from. I mean, I rejected out of hand as my experience. It had nothing to do with the horror genre of reading this book. But I can see why some people would say. But for them, they never said this was a work of literary fiction. They said it was a horror novel. So either you say it's a huge success as a hybrid novel between literary fiction and horror. Or you say it's a failure on both fronts because half its audience didn't even realise it was horror and the other half of its audience didn't realise it was uh, literary fiction. So, I, you know, I love this book. Um, I recognise sort of that, it, yeah, it's a sort of hybrid genre work, um, but I missed that at the time. Uh, eight. What genre do you wish was mixed with literary fiction? Uh, none, uh, for the reasons I give above. I don't, you know... That question is the wrong way round. If you read a book like the Danielewski and it covers both, that's great. But I don't want to, as a writer or a reader, go, oh, I'm in the mood for writing or reading a book that has uh, science fiction with high literary values. I never think like that. You know, I pick up a book that I think I'm going to be in the mood for. Um, now, having said that, well, again, another reason why there should be no distinction between genre and literary is there is no reason that literary fiction books cannot be page turners, cannot be exciting. In the same way as there's no reason why genre books can't have the highest values of language and metaphor and you know, interiority that I spoke about before. Now, most on both sides don't. You know, there's so many literary fiction books that you wouldn't call them page turners. You, you, you can bask in the language and the imagery, but there, there's no there's no real momentum, you know, driving you through the book other than you know just exquisite language or exquisite imagery or you you know the character. You're totally you know immersed in the character. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a criticism. Um, David Markson is another possibly experimental writer. I just finished this book, Reader's Block, last week, and I will be posting it in my Friday Reads, a review of it. But he wrote in one of his other novels, uh, because his novels are made up of epithets, aphorisms, factlets, cold from other writers. So basically they're the products of his reading. But every so often he inserts little things about the author character who's writing these books. Plus you get insights into the author character through the arrangement of these quotes and things from other authors because that reflects his own obsessions. 
And he says, you know, there is always a character of a writer in, in these books. And in one of the books, I think it's in This Is Not A Novel, says something like, he wants to write a book without characters, without plot, but it still has to be a page turner. And that is the key for literary fiction. You know, you could be as self-indulgent as you like, but if it doesn't make the reader turn the page, you, you've lost. And readers can turn the page, not because they're on the edge of their seat, not just because they're on the edge of their seats and they want to see what happens next. A page turner can be, I'm enjoying the sumptuous language, I'm enjoying the sumptuous imagery. I love this character so much, even though they're doing nothing but sitting around in a library. Or whatever it is, that can be a page turner. You know, readers read books for different reasons. You know, I don't read books for plots. I don't read plots of stories. I don't even read plot, uh, books for characters. I read it for ideas that make me reflect on, you know, my own place in the world or whatever. And I read it for imagery and I read it for language. And I also really read it for, you know, uh, experiments in narrative form. But most books don't indulge in that. So, you know, this notion of, you know, the divide between literary fiction and genre, again, I reject because, as I say, there's no reason why the strengths of each shouldn't also be strengths of the other. It's true they tend not to be, but it doesn't have to be that way. And quite honestly, it shouldn't be that way. You know, if I knew that, you know, every science fiction book I picked up was going to have the highest value of language, metaphor, and even experimental, you know, narrative form, which I've done in my own, you know, I have written a science fiction novel, then I would read science fiction unfailingly. And in the same way, you know, I'm not a bailer, like Sean the Book Maniac, but if I was, you know, I would like a guarantee that, you know, literary fiction books had enough sort of propulsion to want to make me turn the page rather than bail on them. As I say, I don't. I kind of grit my teeth and get through to the end in the mis misbelief that there will be something salvageable for me to take away from the book. Um, so there you have it. Uh, a really big, big thanks to um, Jasmine uh, for that, because it... <laughs> There's a lot to unpack, I think, in, in you know, literary fiction and the content. And I thought her, her tags, her prompts were brilliant, you know, to allow you the opportunity to do that. So well done, Jasmine. I know that's your first ever tag. And, you know, you've set the bar very high for yourself. So, you know, future tags. But you've got clearly, you know, you, 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 you know, you can set the prompts to get to get us thinking. So thank you very much. I'm going to tag Celia. I'm going to tag Elizabeth at Bookish North. I'm going to tag um, uh, Alan at um, Big Hard Reads and Classics. I think that's what the channel's kind of, uh, called. Um, and of course, anyone else who wants to do it. Okay, so till next time, thanks very much.